We're good. We're going to so I'm going to, so we're recording. We are ready to rock and roll now. Awesome. So I think this is something that's a little more relevant now um, than it is ever. Um, I mean, recovery is always important, but I think people oftentimes really underestimate uh, the mental aspect of it. And right now, um, when people are kind of realizing firsthand, holy crap, the mental part really plays a huge uh, component as to how well I'm recovering. Um, but I like to use a scale. I know John likes to use, um, I've heard you use the visual of uh, like making a deposit or a deposit or withdrawal from a bank account. Um, just different ways of thinking about it. I like a scale. Um, but basically what it comes down to is that the only way you're going to recover is if the demand part of your, your scale is equal to your ability to recover. So going over what kind of goes in each column, right now, mental distress is obviously the biggest thing on people's minds. So finances, job, health, the economy, the media is definitely not um, Our normal stresses that we get uh, are now kind of amplified, so that's something to keep in mind. And then you have your training. Um, and I think for right now, most people's training isn't the biggest stressor. Um, so that's something to keep in mind is right now for most people, the biggest stressor is going to be that mental distress and everything that goes on the other column, right? That balances out the scale that goes into recovery is a lot of the stuff that we've talked about. Um, so at risk of being a dead horse, right? Sleep is a big one. That's going to be the number one. Um, and that's also the biggest one that I think is most readily affected by the mental distress. Um, even if you're still getting the seven hours of sleep, if you're tossing and turning because you're stressed, it's seven, eight hours of crap sleep it's nowhere near the same as getting good sleep. Um, diet is a big one. I think, uh, I know for Brad, that was something, uh, local Brad, yesterday we spoke about was uh, uh, food quality versus just quantity. And that's gonna play a big role, not just getting those uh, macronutrients, but those micronutrients as well. Um, and then down regulation techniques, those things that we talked about in our, our first one, um, the breathing techniques, things that you can do to calm your body down, um, but the only time that you're going to recover and you're going to feel good is if these two things are balanced. Um, if the mental distress and the training, right, you're, you're putting too much on that side of the scale and it's unbalanced, um, you're not going to feel good. If you're using John's analogy, if you're withdrawing more than you're putting into your bank account, you're not going to feel good. Um, and some of the things that go into that, because a lot of people think it's just the performance, um, it's going to be your general mood and your well-being. Um, a lot of times, if you're existing in a state of chronic stress, your hormones get all jacked up, um, your mood gets all messed up, your energy levels, so you're not going to feel good. Something that's a little more relevant right now is your immune system. That's going to tank, um, and that's something that I've experienced firsthand. Is one of the first things is that goes for me when I'm super stressed is I'm constantly, you look at me and I have a cold. Like I just constantly pick up everything, so my immune system craps out completely. Um, more performance related though is your risk of injury goes up your connective tissue isn't as strong as it could be um and that's on the more severe end uh at best you're just not going to get better which still sucks because you want to get better um so realizing that it's not just in the gym it's out of the gym as well it's going to affect a whole lot of different stuff so moving forward um, one thing I want people to realize, especially right now, there's a big difference, I think, between overtraining and under recovery. Um, a lot of people toss around overtraining. And realistically speaking, most people are not overtraining. Uh, they're under recovering. And a lot of people will argue that that's semantics. I don't think that's semantics. So there's a little quick diagnostic, super unscientific. But literally, if you just rate yourself sleep one to five, right? A five would be seven plus hours of good sleep per night good being the main main component there. You can get seven hours of sleep. Let's say you're someone who has sleep apnea. If you don't put your CPAP on, cool, you sleep eight hours and you spend eight hours gasping for air. That's not good quality sleep. Um, so your sleep would definitely not be a five. Nutrition, a five would be an adequate amount of calories for your goals with foods rich in micronutrients. So going back to that conversation we had yesterday, cool, your calories are great. What kind of veggies are you getting in? What are you taking in to get your iron, your potassium, your magnesium, all those things beyond just calories that are going to optimize your health? Hydration, water is important, but are you getting electrolytes? I horribly misspelled it, but you can kind of make out what I was trying to write there. Are you getting the electrolytes you need to facilitate your performance, especially if you're someone who sweats a lot? And then stress, and I think that that's a, um, it's important to be kind to, yourself, kind to yourself with that one, just because a five 
if you're looking at it as five is perfect, realistically, you're never going to not be stressed. There's never, I tell people the only time you're never going to not be stressed is if you're dead. Um, if you're alive, there will be some degree of stress, even children, right? In preschool, you're stressed because Timmy, the big kid on the playground, stole your toy, right? There's always a degree of stress that comes with being a living, breathing creature. Um, so five might not be realistic, but I would gauge that on a four or above being, do you have a coping mechanism? Do you have a way of managing it? Um, perfect stress management isn't the absence of stress. It's not letting it rule your life. Um, and then daily soreness and pain. Are you always in pain? Um, you know, like, is it the kind of pain where it hurts to go up the stairs? It's impeding your daily life. So if you rate yourself and you're under a three and all those, you might not be overtraining. It sounds like you're under recovered. And the reason I say that is because that means you can fix your sleep. You can fix your nutrition. You can fix your hydration. You can fix your stress. You can fix the soreness, whether it's tweaking the programming, whether it's doing more mobility, whether the soreness is a result of all the stuff above, right? Um, but there's room for improvement. So if there's room for improvement in your recovery and you can still, there's room to deposit in that recovery account, doesn't sound like you're overtraining. It sounds like you're under recovering. Now, if all that is a perfect five and you still feel like hot garbage on a day-to-day -day basis, then there's a good chance you might be doing too much. But most people, when they say they have an issue and they fall under, all right, well, my immune system is crap or I don't feel good, whatever it is that they feel they might be doing too much, um, you ask them and one of these things they're usually deficient and probably more. Um, that's not the most scientific diagnostic tool, but realistically, if you can improve on one of these things, you're not maxing out your ability to recover. Um, so I would definitely put you more in the under recovery category, not so much the overtraining category. Um, going back to where are we at up here. Right, so going back to the diet part a little bit, because that's something that I think is gonna be a little more relevant to people right now, is realizing that you can have the calories beyond point. Um, and yes, at the end of the day, the end all be all for weight, not body composition, just weight is calories in versus calories out. Um, but optimal health goes a lot far beyond just what your weight is on the scale. Um, so using bread, local bread as an example, hopefully he watches this one, is switching from pasta to potatoes, right? You have more micronutrients. Um, you're also going to get less inflammation depending on whether you're having stuff that agrees with your body. Um, so really realizing that recovery looks different for everyone. For me, my optimal sleep is seven hours and I need to sleep in a super cold room or else I toss and turn. For me, my diet, what is optimal for me and makes me feel good might be wildly different than what makes someone else feel good. I'm super lactose intolerant. I look at cheese and my face swells. Like it's just not a good relationship. So I know for me that causes inflammation that's not something that I want to add into my diet. So all this stuff that's in this column isn't an end all be all for every single person um, because every single person is going to be different. It's about finding what works for you. At the end of the day though, some universals are you should be eating a diet that's rich in micronutrients. You should be eating a calorie level that's based on your performance goals or your body composition goals, whatever your goals are. Um, but there should be a rhyme and reason behind why you're doing what you're doing. Um, what that looks like for you though might require experimentation, which is why I'm not uh, fond of giving concrete, hardcore, this is what you need to do. Um, so much as I am fond of giving just principles because at the end of the day, we all need to eat micronutrients. We all need to get good sleep. We all need to de-stress a little bit. It's just going to look a little bit different for each and every single one of us because we're different people. Um, any questions on that, Brad, since you're right there here with us? I know I've talked a lot. Uh, I think a lot of people, you know, they could overstress about a lot of this. And, and just add to the problems, you know. Uh, I'm not getting enough sleep, what I do. And, you know, just keep thinking. Of, and, and, you know, I think everybody just needs, if they relax and just kind of focus on one thing at a time, you know, they'll be a lot better off. Get your nutrition right. And then nutrition, will, you'll, you'll feel better. And then you'll be sleeping better. So it's just, you know, one thing at a time. Percent, Yeah. And I think that's a big thing that people don't get is, uh, you know, especially when we went over sleep, right? I gave you three columns of stuff. I'm going over what sleep, nutrition, hydration, stress, daily soreness, five different things. 
um, it's overwhelming. You want to do one thing at a time because then that's going to add to your stress. Um, and one of the funny things that I've found is I think stress is one of the biggest inhibitors of performance, of recovery, of your immune system, of everything. Stress is a killer. Um, and I think people stress out about being healthy. Um, it becomes its own disordered eating pattern. So ironically, I think we get obsessive to the point where we're doing more more harm than good. So yeah, hundred percent agree. You need to focus on one thing at a time. Nutrition, you know, focus on nutrition first, I'd say, and nutrition will take away a lot of so, you know, your inflammation will go down. Oh, yeah. You know, so, it, so, it just uh, improves everything. Yeah, so I wanted to uh, kind of piggyback on that. And so like for, for me per personally, um, I know for myself, um, getting my sleep correct was uh, my kind of linchpin, if you will. I think everyone's different. So uh, I just know like, cause I tried to focus on nutrition for like many years and then like getting the sleep study, getting the CPAP, like that was like kind of the, the trigger that kind of, that allowed me to really get everything else dialed in. I think everyone is different with where and what they could, should start on. But I would say Brad, definitely. Um, I think everyone could probably focus a little bit more on nutrition. So, but my question for, uh, and I don't think there's a right or wrong answer, but my question for Mel, let's say someone is going through this, uh, maybe they're watching this after the fact and they're kind of going through and maybe giving themselves some ratings. Um, what information could you take from that to kind of determine like which thing that you should maybe focus on first? Like how can you kind of figure out like what's the, the hierarchy of kind of importance in those things if you had to kind of, you know, based on like what, what they score themselves? Yeah, so I think for me, I, I'm really big on triaging, which is, you know, you might have two things. Maybe your sleep is crap, but your stress is giving you panic attacks throughout the day. Um, so I think it's important to, you know, go with the thing that's causing the most damage. And for each person that might be different, maybe your issue is your nutrition is really bad because you have disordered eating because you're stressed, in which case the stress is the overarching issue and we really got to get a handle on that. Okay. Um, but I think it's the, the biggest thing that's creating the, the biggest damper on, on your lifestyle. That's what you got to tackle first. Um, so I know for me personally, my biggest issue my sleep always suffers if I'm super stressed. My nutrition always suffers if I'm super stressed. My hydration doesn't tend to get hit as much, but I know for me, the stress is usually the, the foundation for everything else getting completely tossed out. Um, so it really just depends on the person, but whatever is the most damaging at that point in time is what I would go after first. Cool. I think that's great, great advice for people uh, listening. Cool. But uh, if you've got anything else to add, that's pretty much it. Is, uh, you uh, know. Yeah, I think the other thing uh, I would just kind of add to uh, what you said, too. Um, um, can you scroll up a bit? Um, keep going. Yeah, that's, I guess, okay. I wasn't sure. If, all right, not, not a big deal. Um, I know we talked about, where was it just saying about, um, oh, sorry, go back down. <laughs> sorry, we're playing this. Uh, uh, keep, uh, I guess it was, yeah, so um, as far as, um, I, I guess maybe it was the last one. That's fine. Sorry. Um, you can go back to where you were. That's my fault. Oh, overtraining. Yeah, I just didn't. So overtraining versus under recovery. So uh, another thing I think that, again, maybe it's outside the scope of this, but um that I think it's important for people to kind of talk uh, about and just kind of realize. So obviously we have a, we do programming for people. So, but when people kind of go off program, so to speak, or they start to kind of add in extracurricular activities, if there's a really, really high spike in um, either volume or intensity, I would say it's usually more volume. So like, let's say you go from doing, you know, two or three sets a week on a certain exercise to doing, you know, eight, 10 sets. And there's like this really gigantic spike in volume uh, for a specific movement. Uh, or if you're reintroducing a movement that you maybe haven't done for a while. So like maybe people are coming back from this and they decide, Oh, I want to just like, you know, take 90% and AMRAP it or, and they haven't touched a barbell in like three months. Um, so I think that the, another thing to consider as far as with this is, um, if when you're tracking your training volumes and you're tracking your training history in general, 
uh, just be kind of mindful that there shouldn't be like any super like really drastic changes um, in volume or intensity. Um, so I would say like, if you're like increasing your volume by more than like 50% um, in a given week, I think that's kind of like a, a telltale that you might be start to kind of have some too much fatigue built up in a period of time, or if you're increasing your intensity. Um, now intensity could be a, a tricky one too, because if you're using like, if you go from like a high bar squat to like a low bar squat, you know, that that's not, that's kind of an apples to, you know, oranges comparison, like they're both fruits, but it's a little bit different. So like, obviously if you're really weak in a high bar squat, that could maybe allow you to, you know, transfer over. But, it, but in general, if you have like a big spike in like load or a big spike in, in volume, uh, just from like a, sh from a short period of time, that's like another thing to consider. Um, so like anything else, if you just make sure you're making kind of small incremental changes over time, and I think that will help. And that goes for your training, your nutrition, and I think all the, all the above here. I don't think you want to go from, you know, sleeping, you know, five hours a night to 10 hours a night. Uh, you know, you make the you know, same thing. You make those small changes over time when you're kind of tr troubleshooting these things. Um, and kind of just be honest and objective with yourself uh, with, with all this stuff. And I think and just realize that you don't need to be a five out of five all the time. Um, but as you get closer to a contest, maybe you want to start to kind of, you know, work towards, you know, being a little bit more perfect, uh, if you will. Uh, and then maybe, you know, throughout the year, if you're kind of living between like a three and a four for most things, I think that's fine. But then as you get close to a meet, you know, you want to be more like between a four and a five, you need to kind of maximize the recovery, uh, since your kind of workload is going to be that much higher. If your workload is not as high, uh, then you can kind of get away with maybe, you know, not being as mindful on, on these things. So I think that's kind of a good way to kind of put in, I think to Brad's point too. Yeah. If you're, if you don't really have like really crazy goals or high expectations, or um, you don't really have a contest for a while and you maybe just want to take a little bit of a mental break, I think as long as you're kind of at like a baseline with these things and you're not like really letting your habits go completely. Uh, I think you could be okay to like, you know, like I don't think going for like not sleeping, you know, only sleeping four hours. I, I don't think that'd be a good idea ever, but uh, you don't need to be perfect on these things like all the time. Just have some kind of good base habits and maybe kind of set some daily minimums for yourself. Of, like what's kind of like your, you know, baseline that you're kind of satisfied with. Maybe it's not perfect, but you don't want to kind of go, go below that. So like for me, um, you know, if I'm not getting at least like three liters of water a day, I think that's like not really excusable if I'm not getting at least seven hours of sleep. I'll tell you, if I'm not getting at least like seven, seven and a half, I'm not functioning with the workload I'm doing. And I know some people function on less, but that's just kind of me personally. Uh, you know, how much protein you're getting, how many calories you're getting. So just have some like minimums that are kind of like um, something that you are just never going to go below and it should be manageable. It should be sustainable. It shouldn't be that hard. Uh, but I would just have some kind of minimum standards for yourself for like all these categories. I think that'd be a good uh, kind of thing to shoot for. And then in terms of the stress management, that might be, that mean like maybe your like weekly minimum is, you know, doing like, you know, box breathing, you know, a certain number of times a week where you do yoga a certain number of times a week, meditate. So, you know, you just kind of set some baseline. That's definitely one I'm still working on is trying to, uh, I'm a lot more consistent with the sleep, nutrition and hydration at this point, the stress management could definitely be better. So everyone's kind of got their thing to work on. Um, that's really all I got. I don't know, Brad, if you wanted to kind of add anything or had any other questions. Uh, no, just to, just to say that, uh, you know, as far as making new habits, good habits, you know, science shows it takes 60, you know, 60 times. You got to do something at least 60 times for it to be a habit. So, you know, if you do it for three weeks and you're like, ah, it's just not feeling right, you know, you just got to keep going. Yeah. It's you it's know, funny because I hear a lot of different things. I've heard like 21 days and I, I could tell you from, from experience, 21 days is seems to be BS. <laughs> so I don't know where yeah. that that number came from, but, um, yeah, I think, um, and I think that you can, uh, if it, it's harder, but I think that you could like, if you're not careful, you can kind of like a, a, a good habit can kind of turn into a different oh, yeah. habit, you know, within, you know, 60 days or, or whatever. Um, you know, I got like a little crazy over the holidays with some, like some of these bulking routines and it took me like a couple of weeks to kind of get back in the swing of things. Uh, but now I feel like I'm like kind of, you know, it's like the diet's like becoming more second nature. So, but I'm, I'm also about, um, yeah, I'm a couple of months in at this point. So it's just a lot more manageable and 
the slip ups are minimal. Um, you know, and also I'm in just, you know, we're kind of in a more controlled environment right now where there's, I'm not, I'm not traveling really and things like that. So that makes it a little bit easier too. Um, cool. I thought this was great. Um, uh, Mel, do you have anything that you wanted to kind of say to wrap up or? Yeah. So I think, uh, I liked what you said about finding something that's sustainable. Um, because I, I'm trying to like, I'm paraphrasing what she said, but I had a client one time that was basically like, I'm either, you know, 100%. Yeah. Right. Or I'm so far off in the other direction. She's like, I'm an, like, on an, on an off switch. And, uh, that kind of, stuck with me because I feel like a lot of people think it's an on off switch and I think it's better to think of it like a um you know those dimmers where you can really customize and control the intensity of it where you know on and off are such far ends of the spectrum where if you're off you're off you're not doing anything you're going backwards and if you're a hundred percent on all the time maybe that's going to work for a peaking cycle where you know you're in it you're going into a meet you can't do that year round you're going to burn out and then you're going to go off and go backwards um, so I think, you know, finding the highest level of adherence that you can, where it doesn't put a damper on your life. The moment you have to start rearranging your life out of a, out of a training cycle, right? Like, obviously, if you're doing a bodybuilding show, if you have a powerlifting competition, it's reasonable to make accommodations. But if those accommodations start to infringe on your life and that you're trying to make that the norm, um, you might have to dim it down a little bit. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but you have to find something that's not going to basically ruin your quality of life. Um, and if you can find that middle ground, you can stick with it, and that's where the changes happen. Yeah, we've used that kind of analogy of like a shark a lot, and you know, a shark has to keep swimming, and and or else it'll die. And you know, there's times that you got to sm- you're going to smell blood in the water, and that's like the time where you're going to sprint. So like, if you're like in a race, which pro- might not be anyone listening to this, but if you are wherever in a race. You don't want to kind of like use all your energy at the start, right? Because then you're not going to have any like thing in reserve for the finish. So you want to be at a good pace for most of the race. And then you want to have a little in reserve. So if you can kind of kick that into second gear and if you could sprint the last leg and potentially pass some people like that's ideal because the finish is what counts. It doesn't really matter if you're out of the blocks. I mean, granted, if you have a good start, that's great but I'd rather have the the best finish, right? So you don't get like a gold medal for the best start. You get a gold medal for how you finish. Um, So that's, that's kind of what's going to determine your placing is who steps over the finish line first, not who gets out of the blocks the fastest. So I think that's a good way to think about it. Um, So as you get closer to a goal an end, an end date, uh, then maybe that's time to sprint and that's time to maybe get things like super dialed in. But in the beginning, uh, just do something you can maintain because you don't want you don't want to trip up early on. You don't want to kind of you know uh, burn out early on. I know, like with myself, um, again for the people that are listening to this after the fact, um, you know, I uh, my sh- my bodybuilding show got canceled. I don't have a date right as of right now. I have a couple of things in mind that I will do in, in lieu of this uh, that are going to be in, you know, within either Connecticut or New Jersey. So I just made a decision. I wasn't going to completely go off my diet, but I just upped my calories a little bit this week because it was not going to be sustainable for me to be at the calories that I was for another seven to nine weeks. It's just not going to, I, uh, my brain would have probably like to stop working at a point. It's already, as it was already stopped working a little bit. I went into the wrong room, uh, you know, the zoom room today. So, you know, I kind of just made that decision just to slowly kind of bump up my calories for a week or two and then kind of go back to kind of normal and think that'll allow me to kind of make more progress uh, longer term because there's, I'm not peaking in four to five weeks anymore. So there's really no need for me to kill myself and then kind of burn out and then not be able to kind of, you know, make progress and kind of plateau. Um, so yeah, I think that's, that's, that's important. And that's, uh, that's kind of a sign of a more disciplined uh, you know, person to kind of recognize like when they're going to take a step back. Cool. Um, that's all I got for today. Uh, thank you guys for coming on. I'm going to uh, stop the recording here and hopefully.